Okay, this time we're going to do some Newton second law problems, but this time instead of having ones where we have the force, we use all those forces to come up with an acceleration and then solve a motion problem. This time we're going to start with the motion problem and work our way backwards to the forces. Again, a reminder that we can think of Newton's second law as a connection We can think of Newton's second law as a connection between kinematics or descriptions of motion, kinematics, there we go, and dynamics or descriptions of forces. Here, either way, wherever we start, we're always starting to try and find acceleration or net force. And with that in mind, we can get over to the other side if we want to think about this as like a little bridge between the two things. So if we're starting with motion problems, that means we're always going to be finding our acceleration and then using this to find our net force and then using that net force to find information about uh, the individual force that's acting on the object. Car accelerates from rest to 50 kilometers per hour over, over a distance of 30 meters. The car engine has an applied force, um, no, well there you go, the engine force is 7,000 newtons. Determine the average resistor forces. So here's our car, 1,000 kilograms. The engine is pushing on it with a force of 7,000 newtons. We want to know what the force pushing back is. So what we're going to do here is we're going to get a net force based on the acceleration. And then using that we'll be able to look at how big that resistive force must have been. So it says from rest to 50 kilometers an hour. We need to be careful here because we need to use standard units. So 50 kilometers per hour cannot be left like that. It needs to be converted into 13.9 meters per second over distance or displacement of 30 meters. So again, looking back at our five equations of motion, we can see that the appropriate equation here, since we want acceleration, is 2a displacement v2 squared minus v1 squared. Substituting our values. And here you can see it was important to convert to meters per second because we have meters here in our displacement. But that's an old issue. Thirty times two is sixty. Thirteen point nine squared is one hundred ninety-three point two one meters squared per second squared. Dividing both sides by those sixty meters. Yeah, three point two two meters per second squared. So, to go from 0 to 50 over 30 meters, that's your acceleration. We can use that acceleration with Newton's second law now to find out what the net force would be. It's a 1,000 kilogram car with an acceleration of 3.22 meters per second squared. So that means that the net force is 3,220 newtons. With that in mind then, I can look at the diagram and sort of just figure it out that if this is 7,000 this resistive force must be uh, knocking that 7,000 down to 3,220 and so 7,000 minus 3,220 it must be negative 3,780 so you can just look at it and think about it directly like that or you can use the fact that the net force is the sum of the forces acting on the object to do it with an equation. So we have the engine force and the resistive forces. I think it's important with this kind of question, because signs are so important, 
to do it both ways, to look at the diagram and think about it, and then to do the mathematics and make sure that uh, when you looked at the diagram and you thought about it, you got it right. So a resistive force of 3,780 newtons is reducing that 7,000 newton force to just 3,220 effective or unbalanced newtons, and that's causing that acceleration. Puck with an initial velocity of 4.5 meters per second slides to rest. V1 is 4.5 meters per second to rest over a distance of 3 meters. Determine the mass of the puck if the frictional force acting on the puck is 3.6 newtons. So this is a bit of a different problem because here we have a 3.6 Newton frictional force. We're going to assume that there's force gravity and a normal force acting on this puck. I guess I can put them on. But they're equal in magnitude and opposite in direction, so they cancel each other out. And so this 3.6 Newton frictional force is the only force that's actually slowing the puck down. And so it, in turn, is the net force. If we think that it's slowing the, f the puck down, it makes sense to include it as a negative. So we'll consider the initial velocity of the puck the positive direction, and then as a result, the force that's causing it to come to a stop is going to be in the negative direction. So I've got that. And now I can see with this, if I'm looking for the mass, the only piece of this equation I'm missing is the acceleration. So again, if in doubt, and you have enough kinematics information, find acceleration, and that'll get you to the connection to, to dynamics, which is Newton's second law. Careful here, we talked about this back when we did this unit in the first place. This meters per second squared, this 4.5 is inside the bracket, the negative is outside. That means when you go 4.5 squared, you get 20.25, the negative does not get squared away. The end result of that is that I get an acceleration of 3.375 meters per second squared. And it's negative, and that makes sense since the puck is coming to rest. Okay, well, that acceleration, I can stick it into my expression for Newton's second law here. And if you'd forgotten a negative on either of the two situations in which I mentioned that you have to be careful that things stay negative, then when you went to put this number into this equation, you would have gotten a negative mass. That should be a pretty good indicator, indicator to you that you've lost a negative somewhere during the problem. Dividing both sides by 3.375, we're going to end up with a mass of that puck of 1.1 kilograms. So there you go, another situation where we started with motion information. Again, you're always finding acceleration or you're finding net force. We happen to be given the net force this time, so when we had the net force and the acceleration, the only thing we were missing was the mass, which worked out to be 1.1 kilogram. All right, last one for this video. A person of mass 50 kilograms is standing on a bathroom scale in the elevator. I know it makes no sense, but it helps us think about the normal force in a little bit more detail. Determine the reading on the scale. If the elevator accelerates up at 1.2 meters per second, down at 0.8 meters per second, or the elevator is at rest or moving with a constant velocity. 
Let's deal with A first. Here's the person. They have a mass of 50 kilograms. We assume that they're subject to their normal gravitational force. Negative 9.8 newtons per kilogram. Again, we're assuming they're on Earth. So the gravitational force is 490 newtons. So they're accelerating up at 1.2 meters per second squared. Since we have the acceleration, we can go straight away and get the net force That's going to work out to 60 newtons. And so what's providing that upward force? What's making you move up in the elevator? Well, it's the normal force from the floor. So the normal force must not be equal to the force of gravity, but it must be equal to the force of gravity plus the force required to accelerate you up. If I look at these diagrams, I think I can see that it's 550 newtons. It's got to be 60 newtons bigger than that 490. But if I want to use the equation, F net is equal to the normal force plus the force of gravity. And when I bring that uh, 490 over, my normal force works out to be 550 newtons as discussed. So that's weird. The bathroom scale actually has to push up on you more than it expects to. Now, no, no bathroom scale is going to read 550 newtons. It assumes it's just working against gravity. So if it thought it was going to be pushing against 9.8 newtons per kilogram, but it actually ends up pushing against a little bit more, it's going to give you the wrong reading. Specifically in this case, it's going to assume that it's pushing against six extra kilograms, those six extra kilograms being the six kilograms that are required to actually cause that acceleration in the upward direction. So the bathroom scale is applying a force of 550 newtons, but it's not going to read 550 newtons. It's going to assume that there's a factor of 9.8 in there. So if you want to know what it's actually going to read, you have to divide that 550 newtons by the 9.8 and it will give you that reading or that force in kilograms. So that's if the elevator is moving up. What does this look like if the elevator is accelerating down at 0 0.8 meters per second? So same basic problem here. Same force of gravity. Normal force is going up. But this time, the normal force isn't completely big. It's a little bit lower because it's letting that force of gravity push you down at an acceleration of 0 0.8 meters per second squared. Uh, that's a negative acceleration because you're going down, which is good because what that means then is the normal force isn't going to be as strong as it usually would be as it lets you accelerate a little bit. This sounds like a great way to lose weight. We can convert that point 0.8 into a uh, net force by multiplying the mass times the acceleration. Don't forget the sign there. So the net force ends up being negative 40 newtons. So again, by inspection, what we can see is that the gravitational force is getting to do its acceleration. So the normal force must not be as big as we thought it was going to be. We thought it'd be 490, but it's going to be 40 newtons short of that. So it's actually going to be negative, or not negative, sorry. It's actually going to be 450 newtons. We can also use the equation. Be more specific instead of F1 and F2. That's the normal force and the force of gravity. So that negative 40 Newton net force is going to be equal to the 
normal force plus the negative 490. When the negative 490 comes over to the other side, it becomes positive 490. And so that works out to 450 newtons for the normal force. Again, unless you have a fancy physics bathroom scale, it's going to read in kilograms. So you need to think, what does that bathroom scale think the relationship between newtons and kilograms is? And that is 9.8. And you get 45.9 Oops, kilograms. So that's the, uh, that's the mass that would read on the scale even though the person's 50. So look at that, they've lost like 4.1 kilograms. Last question here, the elevator is at rest or moving with a constant velocity. That means that Newton's first law applies, that the acceleration is zero, which means the net force is zero, which means the mass on the scale is pushing in exactly the situation it expects to be pushing and so if you weigh 50 kilograms and your scale is correct, then it's going to say that you're, it's going to push back with uh, a 50 kilogram or 400 newton normal force. So there are some problems where we started with motion information and we worked our way over to the forces acting on the objects.